background. And I'm working in QAMS, and especially nowadays I'm, I'm, I'm researching about the internal dozer assessment. And in this time, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, the accident uh, that happened the last year in Korea. Uh, before starting, I'm sorry about not distributing the presentation materials because uh, this presentation included some very sensitive personal information. And this accident is ongoing problem in Korea. Only a few people know about this accident, and now you will be <laughs> included a few people. Anyway, I'm uh, in the last year, last July in Korea, there was a medical accident in which the iodine solution, iodine 131 solution, was was misadministered to the wrong patient who was waiting for discharge. As you know, the in the medical field, a tremendous amount of radioactivity is, uh, are generally used for uh, medical treatment uh, at once. So even very small mistakes can lead to a very high unintended ex exposure. Our institute, Kiramps, was informed about this accident immediately and was asked to uh, assess the dose of the patient. Only dose assessment, not medical, uh, medical monitoring. Uh, so in this, for this assessment, we developed some uh, methodology of personalized dose assessment considering the individual specific uh, physiological characteristics. Uh, I'll tell you about this. The patient was an adult male, had a malignant neoplasm in the adrenal medulla. I don't know exactly what kind of disease it is, but uh, this patient, for for diagnosis and medical therapy, he had uh, severe medical histories of taking uh, iodine 131 and iodine 123 uh, labeled with MIBG, which is a kind of uh, uh, compounds of radio pharmaceuticals. In the same purpose, uh, the last July uh, on 19th last, last year, uh, the patient uh, patient received the intravenous injection of iodine 131. MIBZ of uh, uh, 7.4 gigabacteria. Uh, this for the medical treatment. This is n this was not accident, but accident happened uh, occurred uh, two days later. This uh, injection, uh, the patient was waiting for discharge, but medical assistant confused this patient with another patient, and she gave the iodine uh, free free iodine solution uh, to uh, of uh, five five point five gigabacteria to this patient. So this patient, uh, again, uh, orally ingested the iodine solution, even though he already uh, had taken the injection. So this, this exposure was not intended and was not justified. So this exposure was accident exposure. Therefore, uh, this misadministration exposure is the main, was the main focus of the those assessment. Uh, so the dose assessment was limited to this misadministration uh, because this MIBG exposure was not uh, uh, was able to be considered enough uh, enough justified for the medical procedure. Uh, fortunately, the patient had taken the Luger solution to block the thyroid uptake of iodine with, in, uh, in accordance with the medical procedures. Since, uh, since two days before the injection. The initial dose of the patient was uh, simply calculated using the dose coefficient, the reference dose coefficient, which, which was provided by the SRP. And in case of iodine, iodine radio pharmaceuticals, the dose coefficients were provided in the ICRP publication 128, especially the thyroid uh, which is intentionally blocked, like this patient, uh, by thyroid blocking agent. Uh, the corresponding dose coefficient was separately provided, like these figures, and we used it. And the result, like this table, the absorbed dose of the thyroid was higher than uh, 20, uh, 12 gray uh, in spite of the thyroid blocking. But fortunately, the bone marrow dose, which was very important in terms of life, uh, was relatively low. And the effective dose of the patient was calculated at uh, 1.6 sievert, not millisievert, 6 sievert. 
But this initial does has a very serious limitation because um, because ICRP does coefficient assume the completely blocked thyroid, which cannot be achieved practically. In the real situation, the thyroid cannot be uh, completely blocked by the Lugar solution. Uh, for this for this reason, the ICRP also mentioned that incompletely blocked thyroid would uh, increase the radiation dose. These figures, uh, uh, the gamma scan images of the patients was were which were taken uh, taken after accidents. Uh, as you can see, the next day next day after accident, the iodine uh, started to be gathered in the thyroid, and after about three weeks, uh, a relatively large amount of iodine uh, was observed to the thyroid, which presented the uh, incomplete blocked thyroid of the patient. For this reason, we thought the initial dose, initial dose which was simply calculated using the dose coefficient, uh, was not reliable, uh, what was not enough reliable for determining the dose of the patient. So we had to uh, we had to consider this incompletely blocked thyroid uh, and the uh, discrepancy between the reference biokinetic model and that of this patient for a more accurate dose assessment. So we did the personal, uh, personalized dose assessment considering the patient specific thyroid biokinetics rather than using, simply using the dose coefficient of the ICRP. We called it uh, personalized dose assessment, and this is overall methodology of it. Mm, as the case of this patient, when we already know the intake amounts, intake activities, the only information for uh, dose assessment is dose coefficient. So therefore, we, uh, our, our final aim of this assessment is to calculate the patient specific dose coefficient. But to calculate this dose coefficient, we have to, uh, it's first needed to clarify, uh, finding, find the patient specific biokinetic model, uh, which are reflecting uh, the patient thyroid biokinetics. In this assessment, we choose the particular transfer rate in the biokinetic model uh, representing the thyroid biokinetics, and I will explain later. Anyway, uh, we uh, this, this transfer rate was statistically uh, determined by the repeated data fitting of the biosay measurement values, including the in vivo and in vitro biosay measurement values, and corresponding the predicted biosay values. The predicted biosay values means the calculated activities, uh, predicted activities uh, within a particular uh, organ, such as a thyroid, um, over the time and they can be calculated using the biokinetic models. Uh, in this procedure, I will explain more detail later. Uh, anyway, uh, through these data fitting procedures, uh, we finally determined uh, what predicted values, what biokinetic model uh, were most appropriate for the patient. First is biosay monitoring. The, pa the patient was monitored more than four times, covering two months after the accident in accordance with the IDOS guideline. Uh, and each monitoring the whole body and thyroid and urine sample were measured uh, using the well-established detectors in our institute camps. And the corresponding the measurement uncertainties were determined based on the IDOS guideline, but if needed, the additional, uh, additional uncertainties were introduced to these uh, results. And, uh, predict and, and after that, uh, we calculate the predicted biosay values corresponding the real measurement values uh, using the biokinetic models. As you already know, the biokinetic model is the compartment, mathematical compartment model describing the behavior and metabolism uh, in the body of the radionuclides. So we can calculate the predicted values over uh, using the biokinetic model. Um, but before this calculation, uh, we should establish, we should differentiate the intake events according to the chemical forms and intake times. 
because the physiological behavior in the body of the radionuclides is uh, can be considered uh, be dependent on the chemical forms and not and independent on the other intake events. Although the MIBG exposure is not a focus of the dose assessment, but in these steps, it should be uh, it should be considered because uh, because uh, for the calculation of these predicted values. In addition, this uh, the maximum of five percent of this MIBG solution can be considered a free iodide can, uh, that can uptake to the thyroid. So the MIBG solution in MIBG intakes. Uh, was divided into the two intakes, and the third intake is the misadministration. And finally, the intake scenario was established like this table as the multiple acute intakes. This is uh, already you you already show so in this model. Uh, so this model, uh, this is the recent uh, biokinetic model for the free elemental type of iodine, which was. Uh, Adapted in the ICFP publication 128 and the other recent publications. Uh, in each each compartment, each compartment represents the, each source organs or tissues that uh, the iodine, radioiodine, uh, can be observed to, and the uh, arrows in this model represents the transfer transfer of radioiodine in body between the compartments between the uh, source organs. There, in, in this model, there is a special point we should notice in terms of thyroid blocking. This red box means the thyroid. Uh, and this thyroid was divided into the uh, two sub compartments, which were uh, according to the chemical type of iodine, which were first uh, inorganic iodide, the thyroid one compartment, and organic iodine. Side of the two compartment, so this transfer, this transfer uh, from thyroid one compartment to thyroid two compartment represent the organification mechanism, uh, hormone synthesis mechanism of the iodine in the uh, thyroid. This is very important because uh, thyroid blocking effect uh, can be interpreted uh, as the interruption of this me organification mechanism rather than absorption of iodine to thyroid. For this reason, uh, if the thyroid is blocked, thyroid is blocked by the lugar solution like this patient, the, this transfer rate uh, will be affected and will be, might be reduced. So the ICRP and uh, Legend, the developer of this model, also set this transfer rate to zero for assuming the completely blocked thyroid. Through this comprehensive interpretation of this side of blocking, uh, we concluded that uh, the patient also, the patient thyroid also blocked by the Lugar solution. So the, this transfer rate, uh, we notated this transfer rate as the RTH value. And this RTH value of the patient uh, was also affected by the blocking and uh, uh, might be reduced, and, but but not zero. So uh, he has he had might uh, he has uh, the individual the patient specific this RTH value. So for uh, those estimation, the first thing we have to do is uh, was the finding and clarifying this RTH values in this biokinetic model. And this is for. This is the biochemical model for iodine MIBG, which was adapted in the ICIP publication 53. And this one is elementary tract model, recent elementary tract model of iodine 100, as you already saw. Anyway, uh, using the biokinetic model that I described in the previous pages, uh, uh, we calculated the predicted values, mathematically calculated the transfer of the iodine uh, between the compartments were expressed by this uh, first of all, the differential equations, and uh, they were uh, solved by the modules we developed using the MATLAB codes. And the practical values were uh, separately calculated according to the intake scenarios. And in the last uh, final step, it, they are summed. 
Anyway, these predicted values calculated using the BikeNet model, these predicted values, the values and the measurement values, the real values were uh, statistically compiled and fitted for determination of the patient specific RTH values. I will explain more in more detail. We used the maximum likelihood function for statistic determination of patient specific RTH values. The predicted bio values were calculated uh, using the reference BioConnect model and the corresponding likelihood functions also were calculated through this equation with the measurement values. The large M means the measurement values and large P means the uh, predicted values. As we already know, the higher value of this likelihood function means the statistically better fit. These two steps, these two calculation steps of uh, price values and the likelihood functions were repeated, were, repeat, were iterated with, uh, for increasing the RTH value from 0 to 95 with the uh, increasing interval of 0.01. The 95 means the normal thyroid without any blocking. Anyway, uh, after about uh, 9500 9, times iteration, uh, we finally uh, statistically and numerically determined the final RTH value that maximized the likelihood functions. This final value best fit uh, the measurement value of the patient. So it can be uh, considered as the patient specific RTH values. And the, the results was tested using the uh, chi scale values. This is the result. The finally, the point 0.11 value was calculated, uh, determined uh, as the patient specific values, which was much lower than normal value, and it finally yielded 24 our side of take fraction of 0.59%, which was a little higher than completely blocked thyroid and uh, statistically acceptable. These figures show uh, the thyroid monitoring results. And this point, black point means the measured value of the thy thyroid and the black line means the predicted, finally calculated predicted values using uh, the final RTH values. As you can see, that these predicted values very well describe the measured value. That means uh, that this final value very well describe uh, the patient specific thyroid biokinetics. Uh, these are the results of the whole body uh, monitoring and uh, urine sample monitoring. Although there are some discrepancy between the predicted and uh, measured values, but we thought this, this, uh, this discrepancy were statistically acceptable and logically because we thought the main focus of this data fitting is determine the thyroid biokinetics strongly related to the thyroid monitoring rather than this whole body and the urinary excretion monitoring. Anyway, uh, after determination of biokinetic model, uh, the patient-specific dose coefficients were calculated using the biokinetic model and uh, other fundamental data, including the voxel phantom based uh, ICAF values and the nucleotide decay data, and etc. All procedures and data were based on the ICRP publication 103, which is which was the new recommendation for the radiation protections. And ICRP recommend, recommended the voxel phantom uh, as the reference human phantom. And uh, fortunately, the SAF values, the specific observed fraction based on the voxel phantom were published in ICRP 134. We used them. And ICRP also proposed a new concept of effective dose using the sex average equivalent for does, and also updated the tissue weighting factor as you already know, like this figure. And nuclei, nuclei decay data in ICRP publication 107 were used for this calculation. 
And for this assessment and calculation, we developed several modules, calculation algorithms as modules uh, for the calculation, the dot coefficient and the predicted values and some uh, statistical de decisions. So we developed uh, several modules, calculation modules using the MATLAB codes. And before adapting them to the patient, we verified these calculation algorithms and modules using the reference dot coefficient provided by uh, the ICRP. Fortunately, ICRP also provided uh, published the reference dot coefficient for occupational exposure, which were calculated using the same exactly same data and procedure we adopted. Uh, in case of uh, Covert 60 and Zinc 65, uh, these, these recognize is also uh, beta and gamma radiation emitter, uh, like IDO131. And the compared to the result like these figures, uh, the red, red, red bar means the dot coefficient we, we calculated, and the black bar is the reference dot, co co uh, co dot coefficient of the ICRP. As you can see, the every uh, dot coefficient uh, or very similar, and the maximum deviation is about 3.6 percent. In case of IODN 131, unfortunately, now uh, only effective dot coefficient was pro provided. Uh, so the results were very exactly the same with our uh, dot coefficients. Through this comparison, we concluded that uh, we, c we confirmed the reliability of the algorithm and modules we developed. As a, and the final result. Okay, the final dose coefficient and the final dose of the patient were listed in this table. And the red ones uh, are the main organ observed dose. Uh, as we can expect, the thyroid is the most highly exposed organs. The observed dose was higher than 22 gray. And the stomach and the kidney observed dose uh, is higher than two gray, and the salivary glands observed dose is about 1.5 gray. The effective dose was finally calculated 1.53 sievert of the patient. You should notice this is only from the misadministration except for MIBG exposure. This figure is the comparison result with the initial dose that I showed in introduction which were calculated using the reference dose coefficient for uh, completely blocked thyroid. As you can see, the first thing uh, is the thyroid observed dose. Uh, the thyroid observed dose was calculated uh, two times higher than initial dose. Uh, there is a big difference. This difference indicates that if we, uh, if we just simply use the Mm, dose coefficient for completely blocked thyroid, we would, uh, we would uh, underestimate the thyroid observed dose by twice. And so we, through this personalized dose, of, of, uh, the, dose assessment, we, we was able to avert the considerable underestimation of uh, the thyroid observed dose. Nevertheless, the effective dose are very similar. Mm. This is from uh, the decrease of the stomach does, I think. Adopting the new elementary tract model uh, designate, designated the uh, oral cavity as the initial compartment uh, rather than stomach. So the new elementary tract model reduced the stomach uh, observed does and it contributed uh, effective does. In other words, even if there is a considerable uh, difference in the organ doses like this, but effective dose can be calculated at the same values. I think this is why the quantity of the effective dose is not appropriate for determining or evaluating the health effect of the specific individuals. So it's better to use the organ observed dose or the RB weighted observed dose for uh, some finding or evaluating the deterministic effects of the individual. 
Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, our institute, QRAMS, has uh, developed other methodologies for those assessment, including the MIRD, BIRD method, using the uh, medical images such as gamma images, gamma camera images, and the cytogenetic biostatus biodosimetry using the chromosome defect, such as dicentric chromosome defect or a tr translocation of uh, chromosomes, and the approximate method using the CBC, complete blood count. But I think these method methodologies are not enough reliable for determining the patient does because there are not enough uh, information for those assessment and some some methodologies are um, not appropriate. I, I think uh, some methodologies were uh, not proper for determining the internal does. But just nevertheless, we use these methodologies uh, for comprehensively understanding and uh, personalized final does like this. Anyway, we through these uh, methodologies we finally confirm the uh, comprehensive coincidence uh, dosimetrically and pathologically. Okay, it's the end of my presentation. Uh, we, we have not enough time, but because the next lecture was waiting. Uh, but you have any questions about this presentation? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. How long did it take for you to calculate the patient-specific dose? Mm. Oh, we, uh, I think, because we have to, we have to uh, develop the calculation modules using the MATLAB codes. It's a little. Uh, it takes. It uh, it took uh, uh, one month, uh, but. Uh, as as uh, as I saw, as I showed the measurement data, uh, the patient was monitored uh, for about two months. So uh, after uh, three about three months after accident, we we reported the final results of this dose. Another question. You mentioned that uh, you want to, it would be better for you to have uh, uh, absorbed the dose uh, coefficient for the organic dose, right? Have you ever checked uh, with the uh, Oak Ridge lab? They, 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 have the, they have the numbers, the dose coefficient, you know, for, uh, for absorbed dose or equivalent dose, organic dose. You, 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 you use the word the organic dose. For, yeah. for the verification. Yeah. Yes. Organic dose. You, you want to have that kind of dose coefficient? Uh, you, you asked me comparison with the uh, no, accuracy data coefficients. Yeah, well, you said you, you want to have that data dose coefficient, but you cannot find it, right? Yes, right. Yeah, you, you can only find the effective dose coefficient for, for the OF. Uh, this is the iodine-131 dose coefficient? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, uh, in this for this verification, uh, ICP recently uh, ICP updated uh, a lot of data for the dos dosimetric data, yeah. especially the voxel phantom uh, with the SAF value, the SAF value, specific observed those fraction uh, values for based on the voxel phantom were needed, uh, but uh, yet uh, nowadays ICRP using uh, ICRP published those coefficients using the recent data, mm -hmm. uh, and this is the recent most recent data using the recent data. Okay, and so, I just want to want to see, you know. Uh, uh, might check with the uh, Oak Ridge lab, the Rich uh, Legate, to f to find the most uh, relevant uh, dose coefficient. And they have that data. Mm. Yeah. You. Okay. You 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 tell me. Well, you you in one area you mentioned that you want to have uh, the dose coefficient mm. for n not only for effective dose but for all other other dose organ dose or observed dose. You don't have the data, right? Yes, right. Yeah, you can check with the Oak Ridge Lab. Yes. Yeah, or you you go if you add, if you have a software called AIDE, mm -hmm. you might you might be able to get the numbers. Yeah. 
Yes, is the data is uses the recent data, recent BioKinet models and recent mm. SAF values and phantoms, oh. right? Yeah, but you don't have the data, right? Do you? Yes, the recent, recent uh, fundamental data. We, we need the recent fundamental data. Okay. Uh, those coefficients. But you cannot find? Yes, right. So uh, it's not, uh, nowadays ICRP also uh, calculating the, those coefficients using the recent uh, physical data. Yeah. So this is the first data, I think, this is the first data uh, we, can, uh, we can obtain. Okay, yeah. yes. Uh, okay, I, I can take <laughs> the... Your, okay, your yeah, question. thank you. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, so next uh, on our agenda is the last presentation for the day, uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Eduardo Herrera from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Eduardo is our colleague, is a medical doctor, originally from Chile, and he is looking uh, at the incidents and emergency center of IAEA. He is looking after the area of medical response. Uh, we are very happy to see you, Eduardo. We see you on the screen. Can you hear us very well? well yes. Yes, I can hear you perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, we can also? hear. We can hear you, and we see you very well on the big screen. <laughs> so. Eduardo will present uh, um, us the case report uh, on the Guyana radiological accident. The floor is yours, Eduardo. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. First, to say thank you very much for WHO, to you, Janet, for the invitation. Also to Kirams, for Dr. Jean, and all the team uh, involved in the development of this uh, workshop. Uh, doctor, I, I can I cannot name all, but also colleagues from Japan and all of you. It's uh, very nice seeing you and such a great honor to to present in this important uh, uh, workshop. So please, let's continue with the presentation. Um, well, the importance of this case, uh, even when it's already 31 years of this accident is uh, that this model can be replied and can occur, this kind of accident can occur in any country. The next, please. Most of the information that I will introduce in this case will be from this report, the Goyania Radiological Accident, is a publication from the IAEA. Some words about Goiania. Goiania was a very a small city in Brazil. Brazil has more than 200 million of inhabitants. Um, sorry, I don't know. The, Connection went off. So the Goiania city is about one million of inhabitants still nowadays. Uh, the next, please. These are some pictures from the report and others from the experts that were in terrain, like Carlos Alberto dos Santos. So two scrapyards went into an abandoned hospital that was in ruins, and they found a teletherapy equipment of cesium-137. These are original pictures of the place at the moment when the people, after the reconstruction of this accident. The next, please. So two scrapyards uh, workers that were looking for metal, they suddenly found in these uh, premises such a big uh, um, The Wi-Fi signal has to be very strong, and um, I think um, he's standing in where 
the signals are weak, so it could be a little unstable, but please wait. Okay, I'm sorry again. I don't know. There are some technical problems. Um, well, these two scavengers found this abandoned source of e cesium-137, and uh, they decided to take it home. It was a huge amount of metal, so for them it was a very important source of probably money, and it's a poor family. And they decided to, to detach the head of this radiotherapy equipment and, and you can see in the image that is a, it's a tree, it's a house. In that tree, they decided to open this, and when they opened it, they found a glowing powder of blue color. Uh, please keep in mind this picture of the tree because it's a very interesting uh, when they did the, the dose assessment. So they decided five days later, the next please, to sell this to a young yard and the young yard in this period uh, decided to start to share these pieces because they found suddenly this glowing powder that was so attractive, so interesting, that they were so amazed that they decided to share it with the neighbors, share it with the family, and they start to call all the friends and they start to give these small pieces of this glowing powder. This glowing powder was cesium-137, the next, please. So during the following days, several patients start to, to, to go to medical, uh, for medical help with symptoms like uh, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and also some lesions in the skin. The next, please. These images are not from radiation, but these images are from an uh, endemic disease in Brazil called Pemphigus polyaceus. This Pemphigus has these characteristics of uh, the kind of look like similar to, to erythema, deep ulcers, and the doctor many times diagnosed during the next two weeks Pemphigus foliaceus or insect bite or misdiagnosis. The next, please. It was not until the until the wife of the young yard, a woman is always very intuitive and always observe many details. So she realized that this probably this powder was the cause of all this diseases around the family, around the neighbors. So she took her husband and they went to the hospital, the regional hospital in Goyas, a bigger state, part of Goiania. To the, le to the right, you can see the, the original picture where she put this fragment of cesium and she carried by bus to the hospital. At the hospital, the doctor didn't know what it was, this bag. So he opened the bag, saw this glowing powder, and he suspected that maybe eventually it could be something related to radiation. So he decided to call a friend of him. He was a physicist. This physicist was just by chance in Goiania for holidays. And Nelson Valverde, uh, our colleague from Brazil, always can the story, tell the story that uh, this physicist was carrying a survey meter and when he approached the hospital about 100 meters, the survey meter start to make start to alarm, start activated. He thought that maybe this uh, survey meter was failed, so he returned to the the national authority because he was part of this uh, regulatory authority body, and he, with another device. He went again and he realized it was such a high levels of radiation in the proximities of the hospital. The next, please. 
At the time, the, they were calling the firefighters, an emergency was activated, all the medical plan was activated in Brazil, and the firefighters, being the first one in there, decided as a plan to throw this to the river. Fortunately, the authorities stopped this procedure, and they start with the identification of people involved in this accident. Because they didn't know the magnitude, they didn't know how to, to check how many people was involved in this, they start with the interviews to each one of the involved persons. But when they realized that probably the extent was much higher than this, they decided to do announce it by radio, by TV, and the, please click again, because the main problem was the next, please. That only 16 days after the accident, this was identified as an accident. So there was two weeks of cesium spread by the city of one million of inhabitants. The next, please. They decided to do something that I consider very, very intelligent. They didn't have a triage station in the city, so they decided to use the Olympic Stadium, because in Brazil, they are always fans of football. So they call all the people to the Olympic Stadium to do the triage by TV, by radio. And the next, uh, this, I'm sorry, this is the structure of the medical response. So there was the site of the accident that was already under survey meters, uh, under those assessment. The triage station that was for all the people involved, all the worried well that we call that people that is concerned that really they don't have any, any reason to be uh, exposed, but they are concerned. So all these people were called to the triage station in the Olympic Stadium. In there, there was a primary care area with a medical, social character, and the secondary care station was established at the Goya's hospital. Also, a tertiary care level for the most affected people was established in Rio de Janeiro, and the international cooperation was also activated. The next, please. As you can see, the conditions in Brazil are very difficult sometimes because it's very hot. So in the picture that you see in the middle, there is this, this line is only lines of persons that were waiting for the evaluation in the, in, in the, in the Olympic Stadium. They have uh, tents, they have doctors, they have uh, full equipment for identifying potentially contaminated persons. The next one, please. Also, they did uh, screening for contamination at the schools, at the hospitals, at health centers. And also, they were by the street with these uh, detectors trying to find out if there were more radiation uh, yeah. cases. Please, the next. Finally, at uh, <clears throat> December 22, this accident started on September 13, and it was uh, until 29 when it was discovered. So in two months, they monitored 112,000 people. This is about 15% of the population in the city. So when you think in your own cities that probably you have to do a screening of the 15% of the population, this could be really, really hard for, for any authority to handle. From these people monitored, they found 249 with external or internal doses indicative of contamination. From them, 129 exhibit both internal and external contamination. And from this group, only 49 finally was admitted as the hospital. The next, please. From these 49 people, 20 finally were hospitalized. Uh, Eight presented acute radiation syndrome, cutaneous radiation syndrome at that time, was called local radiation injuries, 20 persons. Uh, from these 20 persons, four uh, died at the later stage. 
The next, please. Because in Goiania, they did not have the capacity to analyze urine samples or biological samples uh, for radiation, they need to transfer, uh, transport these biological samples to different states in Brazil. So we're transferring feces and urine from more than 20 persons, uh, the just hospitalized persons, to Rio de Janeiro, to Sao Paulo, or to different cities to help in this task. And also, they had to transfer the patients to the hospital in Rio. The next, please. These are some images from the report of patients with local radiation injuries. You can see big ulcers that the next, please, will evolve to necrosis. Uh, the, the next, please. That will evolve to necrosis in the follow-up of these cases in some of them and brings to amputations of uh, limbs or hands in some of these patients. The next one, please. Also, they need to adapt. They were using, probably you check in during this training course or this workshop, what is the whole body counter, but basically is a detector um, that is located above the body to detect internal contamination. Normally, the distance is very close to the body, but because of the high level of contamination, the detectors need to be needed to be higher, about one meter, or in cases, 1.5 or 1.8 meters. So this was improvised during the accident for, for this. The next, please. This was also the first uh, main experience after Salvador accident using the cytokines in patients. Uh, several of them were they received the cytokines uh, with some uh, good replies, with, with a good uh, response from the bone marrow. Unfortunately, from these eight patients, uh, from these 20 patients, eight died. Uh, these are the chart of the acute radiation syndrome, and you can see the doses that were very high to from 1.9 to 4.4 rate to the whole body. Uh, one of the most emblematic case was this, the first one of a girl of six years old, that she has such a high, high levels. The next please, that uh, she finally died. It was also one of the times, the first times that where the Prussian blue was used in, in a such massive way. And the doctors observed that even when they, if they give three, six, or 10 grams per day in these cases, the results will be the same for the patient. So that's why they established that the dose would be not higher than three gray per day. Uh, the next place. Also, <clears throat> In logistics, they need to be prepared for the necropsis of the patients, of the dead bodies. So for the necropsis, they had to do also a prepare, they, they have to do a fast training for coroners, and they were organized in more than 14 people to do perform the necro necropsis, staying not, than, not more than two hours uh, in the room. The next, please. As you can see, the finally diagnosis of death was a multi-organic failure due to the high level of radiation exposure. Uh, you can see diffuse hemorrhage and multiple organs, sepsis. Um, also, the dose estimate, uh, the next is okay, yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the next, please, it's okay. Also, they needed to bury these victims. So because of the pressure of the authorities, they built this uh, concrete, very thick uh, burials. And during the, the, the ceremonies, 
the people from Goiania started a huge riot, a huge protest, because they didn't want that their beloved in the cemetery would, could be eventually contaminated by these new bodies that we deposited in there. So it was necessary, finally, that uh, the military police intervene in order to proceed with this ceremony. The next, please. As a result, seven houses were demolished. You can see there was team working 24-7 for after the service. As I told you, please take a look on the arrow, the red arrow, where the mango tree was there when they opened the radiotherapy equipment, and the doses was higher than one gray per hour, one meter above the, the ground. So it was a very high dose of radiation. The authorities did not, did not find any other option than demolish this, uh, this, this small quartier, these, uh, these houses. Please, the next. And you can see 29 years after, in 2006, still this area is abandoned. No one company, no one wants to live in there is uh, still uh, remaining as a, not because of the level, but uh, because of the collective memory. They, they don't want to do anything with this area. The next, please. As you can see, the environmental impact was very high, more than 3,500 uh, cubic meter of waste was uh, recovered. So they need to, to implement a depository of, for waste. The next, please. They built a temporary a deposit for the couple of years, and when they finally completed the task, they did two deposits for 300 years, each of them. Um, they are in Goiania, in, in Goyas. The next, please. A, a, a part of these 20 pairs, persons really heavily contaminated, the most uh, important effect derived from this accident was the psychological consequences. Because of the magnitude of the accident, the meat of the radiation as an evil force, also the low cultural and social background of the victims and patients. Also the previous year was Chernobyl. So it was a big stigmatization for these patients. There was a big psychological consequences for all this group. Even the GDP of the state of Goyas dropped 30% in the following four months. The next, please. So what do we do with all the people that we already did the screen and some of them were contaminated and some others were not? So the government established a long-term follow-up for persons. These uh, persons were divided in three groups. The groups the group one was about 56 persons, which were all those with whole body dose higher than 0 0.2 grays, or with a body burden more than uh, half an alley. And alley was is an annual in limit of intake. It was a measure that was used in that times. Nowadays, also in US, still in use. Uh, the group two, where 46 persons were, persons were exposed, but lower than these levels. And the group three was social victim cases. As you can see from the three groups, the higher the number of people is in the group number three, the social victims. It's important to mention that also they receive compensation. So many people want to be in the, in the group of social persons uh, affected because they were close, because 100 meters from the houses, or because just they were friends of them. In the medical follow-up <coughs> of the deaths between 1987 and 2007, they find out that uh, most of the cases, or all the cases of this accident, except for the first acute radiation syndrome, uh, 
where the cause of death were completely random and not attributable to radiation. An example, traffic accident, assassination, brain aneurysm. The next, please. A liver uh, cirrhosis, one of them was a heavy alcoholic. Several of these cases of these patients were passed by a dependency of drugs as well. Um, the next one, please. Also, the death by cancers were not attributed to radiation. The next one, please. You can find more information about this in this uh, uh, very good epidemiological study of Kaufman, uh, 2007. And the next one, exactly. If you think that this problem is already finished when they did the follow-up, well, no. Because we have, this is a photo from Dr. Nelson Valverde, after 30 years, patients still present ulcers of the local radiation injuries as a recurrence. So there are a lot, several patients with this event, as you can see, one of the young yards still alive, presented this huge ulcer on the foot. He did not want to receive any treatment for that. Uh, international cooperation was uh, also offered in this case, but finally the patient rejected any kind of treatment. The next one, please. So the Goyani accident is uh, one of the most important accidents that we have uh, in Latin America. Uh, it was characterized for protected uh, exposure of individuals of the public to ionizing radiation. The local health personnel were not able to identify the clinical manifestations of the victims as a radiation-induced one. And this is not particularly from these cases. From these cases, we have seen this in other accidents that the doctors cannot recognize, which is also understandable because finally, according to statistics, one doctor have the chance to see only one patient in the entire life of radiation, affected by radiation. But nevertheless, it's important to disseminate this knowledge. The next please. please. This is the flag of the Abadia of Goyas, the municipality in Brazil. And the next one, as you can see, uh, the, you can see the, the, the logo of the, the radiation, the not logo, the three sector of symbol was integrated in the flag of Goyas. Uh, well, thank you very much. The next, please, thank you for, for inviting me and any doubt I'm open to reply. Yeah, it's, it's okay to ask questions because he will be, yes. he, he's watching us. So do you have any questions or comments? No? <laughs> then we must say goodbye to Um, okay. I already shared the <laughs> well, thank you very much. lecture. Yeah. So I actually already sent every one of you the lecture material. So don't worry, including his lecture too. So. so okay. Take okay, care. Thank you very much. Nice meeting to all of you. Um, good luck. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> 네 이제 연결 끊으시면 될것 같아요. Yeah, so, yes, disconnected, yes. <laughs> so, I, I have some announcement before, because we have facility tour tomorrow. So if you are um, supported by Kerams, you are expected to show up uh, to participate in our facility tour. And um, the, Actually, we arranged a charter bus to take you to Kerams. So the bus leaves at 8 from here. So please gather at the lobby like 10 or 5 minutes earlier than that. The bus leaves at 8. And it takes about one hour to get to Kerams. Usually it is 40 minutes, but it is rush hour in the morning. So it'll take one hour. So. 
after we arrive at Kiram's, we're going to have a facility tour, and we'll, uh, we're going to give you um, the certificates and take the group photos as well. Oh, we're going to do it here as well. And then we're, after all the schedule is finished, uh, I think it'll be around 12. So we will be able to return to hotel at around 1. Mm, do you have any questions about this? Uh, I personally asked each one of participants whether he or she is participating. So I know it, but just to double check. So please raise your hand if you're not participating uh, for the group facility tour. So, okay. And, and and I know that uh, the participants from Hirosaki University, they're not participating too because you're leaving tomorrow morning. So uh, except for Hirosaki participants and uh, the, uh, Dr. Richard Boliram and Ha Jung Gong from KHMP, anyone who's not participating? Okay, so I'm, I confirm all the... Per yeah. And ah uh, ah uh, and and one more thing. As I said before, I already uh, sent you an email, uh, the PDF file, to include include all presentations. So please check check that. And I know some of you are returning to your home country tomorrow. And actually, the physical certificates are in Kerem's. So I know some of you are not able to get it. So if you want the certificate, I'll copy and send it to you by email. So please let me know. And, uh, and please, uh, if you are not participating tomorrow, please uh, complete the evaluation form and return it to me. So because we want your feedback. Uh, yeah, actually, um, yeah, it was in the file with the big Kirim's logo. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, before I let you go, let's take a group photo all together in the front.